We are right now at Hidden City Cafe, right. which actually the film Monsters, Inc. was initially named Hidden City. And it was basically the Pixar commissary and for a lot a, of us. And it has a cameo in the film. It does, yes. So it's about three blocks over to where Pixar used to be. I've gotten, I think, probably more questions than, than anything about the DVD release was, was does the monkey work at Pixar? Because we had yeah. this monkey. It's well, the not, first thing you say, it's not a monkey. It's, it's a, a chimp. chimp. <laughs> well, and we talked about it. We thought it would be hilarious. It's just inexplicably. We'd cut to a chimp. <laughs> just, just there. We thought we'd have a chimp there. Yeah. We would never acknowledge the no. chimp. The chimp, the chimp wouldn't would be a part of this, what we <laughs> were talking about. It would and just it wouldn't be always be there. It would be sometimes, but not other times. Well, and a lot of people wanted to come to work at Pixar. Yes, we were in the in new hires that said, you know, the reason why I wanted to work at Pixar is you guys have a chimp. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pitch a sequence with the chimp there. And, <laughs> and I'm so, you know, hey, Sully, what are we doing? And I look over, and no one's holding the chimp. The chimp is going up and knocking its knuckles into the wall. <laughs> And knocking boards over. And I'm like, should I keep going for the camera? So I kept pitching. <laughs> there are a lot of pictures of Lee looking so happy. <laughs> that was one of the best yeah. days of my life, I have to say. <laughs> my earliest memories way back when were you going off to develop a movie. And it was really weird at the time because we everything we had done between Toy Story and Bugs Life, we were doing as a team. Mm -hmm. And you were the first person to kind of break away from that group. I was jealous because you guys would sit at this long table and you'd put newsprint down, like 10 feet of newsprint, and you'd sit with crayons and, and pens and pencils and just let your minds wander and just sit around and laugh and have fun, you know? Every day we'd start by spreading it out and start drawing. Because initially the, the concept was, Pete, you go off and figure something out. I had no real clue of what I was doing. So we just thought of a lot of stuff. Trash Planet, which eventually became Wally, was one of them, mm -hmm. and one or two other ones, but Monsters was the one that sort of landed. The artwork over there was so cool. Mm -hmm. I just remember going over there and seeing, it would kind of think coalesce into uh, Boo then on, on a bed, and it was brilliant mm -hmm. colors, and she had Rasta hair, kind of. Mm. Tons of cool artwork over there. And I remember thinking, that is one of the most imaginative things we've ever done. And, and the story was ripe with possibility. It was, yeah, really, it was a different world, a yeah. new world that we were going it to, was cool. which was really cool. It was a big deal because Good. we had made Toy Story, it was this huge film, and then you were going to be the first person, not John Lasseter, to direct one of the movies. For me, becoming a director is probably the most taxing thing physically and emotionally that I've done in my life, you know, because it's a long race. It's like five years of uncertainty. The most of the notes we got were like, this is wrong and I still don't understand your main character. And so I was sort of living in that world of like, ah, uh, the whole thing is gonna fall apart at any moment, you know? That's what it yeah. felt like. If you really care about it, it's, it's hard not to take it personally and feel like you, the measure of the film is a measure of you as a person, you know? Which is mm -hmm. of course false, but it's kind of the way you feel about it. People yeah. somehow think that we just like spit out a script and then make a movie. Yeah, yeah. And, this, uh, one this one was crazy. Explored. And why don't we do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that you guys were doing a teaser right. with Sully and Mike to get those characters out there. There's nobody here. Huh? There's, there's no kid. There's supposed All to be a kid. Right, there's no kid this game. Panic. I'm panicking because well, there's no, a total no, no, lack no, of kid here. Let's just check the schedule. It's very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And you guys asked me to come on and cut that. Which was a great thing for us just because it helped in the story department. It helped define uh, those characters. But we had but we had John Goodman and Billy Crystal. Right. So that was the thing. It's like we, we really made that teaser sing. And it came out really good. It did, yeah. And as is want with me, as has happened on several films, I got to start to get so enmeshed in the story and the characters and working with you that it was hard for me to leave. So it wasn't long after that John yeah. asked me to come on to the movie and co-direct with you. What's your favorite? scene that uh, that you worked on. Very early on when I first came on, uh, we were kind of reworking the whole initial reveal of the scare floor and yeah. how the scare floor worked. Mm -hmm. And I had this idea, I pulled a piece of jazz off a big band CD that I had, and I cut this whole sequence of all the, the monsters coming in and out of their doors. And suddenly there was this whole cohesive feeling of uh, the mechanics of everything. 
And yet, when you really break it down, it's just all kind of exposition. Like, here's basically, again, all right, audience, here's why we collect Scream and how it all works, the mechanics of it. And that sequence made it just so fun to watch. Yeah. And it also made this world, which is out there, Monster World, just more accessible. It's just a factory that we're watching. I don't think the scene is that much different now mm -hmm. than it was at that point. It was like finding that voice of the film. But I seem to remember that being the beginnings of the kind of vibe we ended up going with oh, the score wise. Yeah. Totally. yeah. Oh, I'm feeling good today, Mikey. Yeah. Oh, boy, <laughs> boy, another dog coming right up. My initial concept was they scare kids for a living, and everybody would say, why? And I'd be like, because they do. That's right. just <laughs> the conceit of the film. You have to buy it. But then, you know, a lot of people, and rightly so, were poking at, well, what's the economics of that? How would they build a factory? How could they afford to set up this entire the scare floor and the door vault and all that? Mm -hmm. and, and I remember Andrew Stanton came forward with the idea that yeah. Scream Energy scream is really what, energy. Scream, right. is scream is what is powers energy. their world. Our city is counting on you to collect those children's screams. Without Scream, we have no power. The other thing Andrew figured out that he was really troubled with was figuring out kind of the, the logic of all the different time zones mm -hmm. all over the planet. Okay, people, Eastern Seaboard coming online. That just because it's nighttime in this one part of the planet, it's daytime on the other side of the globe, and yeah. figuring out the idea of these these big clocks and, and the different shifts exactly, of monsters. Exactly, all the shifts. Yeah. That was a great just idea. Just kind of scaring around yeah. the clock. Our backstory was there were others, like Fear Co. and Scare Masters, they did the under the bed scares and the basement scares. Right, 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 right. Monsters' big claim to fame was their patented through the closet door scare method. That's right. That Henry J. Waterners the first invented. <laughs> and so how many kids around the world have have these closet doors? Therefore, there'd be this many scare floors to handle all the kids if they're scared maybe once every other week or blah, 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 blah. And then that's what led to the vaults. Like, where do they keep all these doors? Right. Well, that's, that I, was pretty early on. I, I think that's that. my favorite sequence. Is the door vault sequence. Yeah, the door vault yeah. sequence is so cool. That well, as soon as we came up really, with that idea, kids, yeah. you know, we store the doors somewhere. Right. And we thought, okay, there must be a place. And just visualizing that, I was like, okay, well, that's going to be a cool yeah. scene. Yeah. We boarded it, and it was fairly cool. Looks like we caught the express, pal. Do you see him? Straight ahead. I seem to remember that the door vault being the first time we really shot that like a live action sequence mm -hmm. where we just did a ton of coverage mm -hmm. and right. uh, we kind of mapped out big big swaths of, of blocking and, and what the mm -hmm. characters were doing and then we just covered it from lots of different angles and found all kinds so of dynamic cameras and then, and then cut goal. it as if we were yeah. cutting yeah. live action. I remember being so proud of it when it was done. Mm -hmm. It's just the camera work, yeah, but, I, but, I, but we see it. We see yeah, it, we know how cool it's going to be. Yeah. What was your favorite sequence, Bob? Uh, Yeti's Cave. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, you bring up Yeti's yeah, Cave. There's always a sequence in every oh. film that you just can't get right, and and the one where Sully and Mike meet the Yeti. Welcome to the Himalayas. But you got the characters at their lowest point. Right. They've, they've they've completely broken up. They're angry at each other. And then how do you how do you remedy that? How do you? That's the scene that's that all one, about mending that. Relationship. Yeah. He was like a yeah. closet therapist. You know, I'm sensing a lot of anger in this cave. You guys got to get over it. It's like my buddy Sasquatch always says, you got to face it, embrace it, and erase it. Look at that big jerk. Mike and Sully, we literally then had them break off the lag tights and start like fighting each other. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to tell Bigfoot about this. All you ever talked about was getting me back on the scare floor. Literally, there were but like was... 25 versions of this yeah. sequence yeah. that you And we got to the point where we had approved it. Well, we had to go. And we, we laid it out, and it was cut. We were, we were a hair's breadth away from starting to animate the sequence, and we finally pulled the plug again and said, this is just not right. Yeah. One, one of my fond memories was that we were getting ready to do that whole sequence where Mike and Sully are fighting, and they roll down the hill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was, I mean, in the drawings, we had snow flying and yeah. the wind buffeting them, and it was this crazy thing. And I remember they, the technical people called us into a meeting and said, okay, let's talk about what you really want here and what we can really give you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember you and I, we were talking about what we were hoping for, but we knew it was just gonna be technically nearly well, impossible. Like, okay, we want you to build the entire side of a mountain <laughs> with all the plants and, <laughs> and snow. And, and, and footprints and snow right. blowing and all this stuff. And it's a one -off. And I remember that, and, yeah. the, and the technical <laughs> people were all like really trying to tell us, well, we, we can't really do this, but mm -hmm. this is what we can give you. And I remember they all went away, and it was a big lesson for me at Pixar that basically with the technical people, if you tell them, if you set the bar low and you say, well, yeah, I, I, I know it's really hard, I really don't think you can do this, that becomes a challenge for them. Because we had signed off on, okay, he won't get snow, snow stuck in his hair. 
yeah. it's just impossible at this point. You no know, it's, We're lucky to have hair at all. So, yeah, no win. And then in the end, of course. But you so. watch it. It's about the believability. I mean, mm -hmm. you believe the moment because it's just so real. And it's the lowest low moment. It so drives it home. And I remember at the rap party when that moment came on the screen and the whole audience just erupted <laughs> in applause. In honor of Yeti's Cave, every sequence that's now impossible to do is called oh, the Yeti's true. Cave. Pixar. That's yeah. right. And Pete, you were asking me what my favorite sequence was, yeah. and I would say, um, you know, the one that that I had influence on that was really fun to do was Mike and Sully when they first wake up in the morning. Get up, Sully! <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe I ordered a wake up call, Mikey. Hey, let's talk. I remember sitting at my my desk and I got a call. It's like you got five minutes to do an opening, and it's like I'm on it. Hung up. Uh, try this. Try this. Try this. Call. Yes, you came up. Woo! Gave me a kiss, yeah. and then we threw it in. You yeah, know, it's yeah. like yeah. literally the that was that was the character yeah. introduction. But we had had the preview, and he used to be introduced by Waternus, who says, "I need scarers who are confident, tenacious, tough, intimidating." I need scarers like, like James P. Sullivan. And then you saw him, and it was confusing to the audience. They're like, who's that that we're cutting to? Where are we cutting? What? Right. Uh, uh. The silliest thing I like in there is, fight that plaque, fight that plaque. <laughs> Scary, Scary monsters, monsters don't have plaques. Plaque. <laughs> Scary monsters don't have plaques, Sully. <laughs> <laughs> In the very early days before I was even on the movie, Mike Wazowski's character was totally different. I mean, you were playing him kind of more like a hip urban uh, kind of sidekick. It wasn't Billy. It wasn't Billy's voice at all. I mean, when you cast he was, Billy, he, he was became a, similar, a completely different character. Yeah, he was a similar kind of guy who was very impetuous and instinctive, and just all he knew was what was right in front of him, and that was all important, and everything else just disappeared. And then as soon as he looked away, that was all important. When we came back from that story meeting from Disney, and they're like. You know, the, the execs there had said, come up with a buddy for Sullivan. Mm -hmm. There was we, a Ricky Nerva drawing, and there was, a, there was just this one-eyed guy in the back of that drawing, and something about him rang out. Do you remember that? Did you? Yeah. We sort of settled on it, and then we split all the, remember that? We split the mm -hmm. story team up into pairs. Right. And we said, okay, mm -hmm. we don't have a sequence, but you guys go off and basically do improv with Sully right. and Mike. Which is Some great. situation. It's a great thing to do in any of these movies, just go play and see yeah. what you come up with. Right. I remember Jason Katz, all he did, his one Pigeon. assignment, and Jeff Pigeon was, pick a tie. You have to wear a tie right. for the yeah. evening. Yeah. What's that tie? And yeah. it sort of brings out the differences. So I was like, I don't know. What about that? And Mike's yeah. just, that one. Oh, really? Because I wasn't even sure I should have put that one out. Oh, you always do this. You ask me for my opinion, and then you ignore it. There's an early animation test. It was yeah. kind of a looks test. Yeah. That had a totally different look than what the film ended up looking right. like. And Mike had one eye in that, but he had no arms. Right. Because initially, the concept was, I don't want this to look like a bunch of guys running around in suits, right? We got to make these, take advantage of what monsters are and really yeah. push that. So we took a sphere with two leg arms, and so he would walk, and then he'd grab whatever he needed, and, you know, so... In the end, it became very limiting. And Sully, at the same time, had the tentacles. <laughs> Which was know. hilarious. He was just yeah. like <laughs> And yeah. there, there again, OK, no guy in a suit. This is, how is he going to walk? It's right. going to yeah. be different. And, well, well, and that's another thing. How many Sully maquettes did we make? And how many, like, the background monsters, remember that? We yes. had tons of drawings and different artists that we'd contacted yeah. doing different design work and finally of course like everything it comes down to kind of economics of okay you have this many weeks to build 5,000 background characters how are you gonna do it right. well you don't yeah. <laughs> which is why you go to Harryhausen's and it's all the guys from the scare floor right, exactly. out in Harryhausen. <laughs> so how did you arrive at, at, at John and John Goodman and Billy Crystal as we started talking about this Scarer, who was this big tough guy, but sort of with a heart, uh, a soft heart at the core. Goodman just sounded sort of like he had this weight to him and a strength. And he had that much range as an actor. Yeah. Did Billy say yes right away when you contacted him? He did. Him? The deal with Billy, right, is that he was originally offered the part of Buzz Lightyear. Right. On Toy Story. <laughs> right. right. I mean, John John did a, a whole <laughs> animation. Test. That was the last thing John ever animated yeah. himself, right? John yep. Lasseter animated an early version of Buzz Lightyear doing some Billy Crystal dialogue from mm -hmm. when, when Harry met Sally. Sally. Yeah. Of course, Billy now says that was the, you know, the biggest mistake of his life, was, yeah. not, was not taking Toy Story. But I love sports. Dodgeball was the best. Oh, yeah. I was the fastest one out there. Of course, I was the ball, but I, <laughs> I was the ball. 
was the ball. Look, I'm a, I'm a ball. Look, look, look at my head. He loves that character, boy. You know, yeah. just, he yeah. talks about Mike Wazowski all the time. The other thing that we did, and I don't remember exactly how this came about, but Toy Story and whatnot, we had never recorded two actors together. Right, and a lot of people think we just get all the actors together and record, but of course, you know, because of everyone's schedules yeah. and everything, you can you can never Sometimes get them in the room at the same meet, time. Yeah. Right. So we got them together. I, I seem to remember at least three sessions least where three. It was we got idea. them together. Yeah, all it was the scenes, scenes he really wanted to work. All with the scenes with where they had to interact, and you know, the whole concept was Walking they'd been friends work, since and kindergarten. Scare and training and all that, and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, we actually had them together, yeah. and it's just right. like it takes yeah. it to a whole nother yeah. level. If yeah. if you've got a chemistry there yeah and, and we they, which we did yeah. and they were all about like who can out funny the other one and, and the, they, they were but they're also up. they also balance each other really well yeah. like the locker room scene before they go out on the scare floor you know yeah. and stink it up it's a wet dog that all just was mm -hmm. improv right then and there hey can i borrow your odorant yeah i got uh smelly garbage or old dumpster you get the uh, low tide no. how about wet dog yep stink it up and boo is so awesome you can do her song <laughs> Sailing comes along. <laughs> na, na, na. Sailing coming along. Uh, are you done in there? She was initially like seven or eight, mm -hmm. and we aged her down to about two. The girl that we had yep. recorded to do the voice was Mary the Gibbs. daughter of Rob, who is Rob, one yeah, of the story, story guys. guys. Yeah. Working with Mary, I thought, okay, it's gonna be like normal, I'll have my script and we'll walk in and we'll do the lines and she'll stand there and maybe I'll say them and she'll parrot them. Well, she didn't stand still, she just ran around. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up picking the microphone up and following her around and I just tricked her into doing the sounds by playing with puppets or soft toys that wouldn't make a lot of noise and so we couldn't really plan for, like if you needed something specific, too bad. Yeah. You just had to kind of get what you got and then you had the fun of finding all the little bits and pieces. Boo! <laughs> so should we talk about 9-11? Or? Yeah, that was quite late into the film. We were in the middle of our sound mix the day that that happened on 9-11. So and I, I remember coming into, uh, you know, we, we all found out about it, and I, but, you know, everyone was like, well, do we, do we go to work? Do we, you know, what do you do? <laughs> but like a lot of people, we did end up going to work. I remember the prevailing feeling was, that what we were doing was so trivial. This day in history, September 11th, 2001. So intense. Yeah. Seems kind of bizarre to be making cartoons, you know. It does. It was really hard to get momentum and get excited about finishing the movie because there were such big things happening in the world. And the other thing that ended up being scary was that our movie was coming out basically 60 days after the towers fell. We just wondered, like, are people even going to want to go see movies? Right, that, because the, there was such a dark the, mood in the world. Even later with some of the scares about the uh, anthrax. Right. Mm -hmm. And so here, a fundamental element of the film are these big suited guys, <laughs> you know, walking around. <laughs> and we're thinking, oh, this is a <laughs> <laughs> But you've been, We've been making this movie for years, and Can't this thing just it. happened to happen right at the end of making the yeah. movie. Yeah, we changed the scene Right, there was the one film. scene that we oh, changed. Oh, that's right, we had a whole, yeah. we, we had, had a scene. At the end of the sushi restaurant scene where Boo escapes from the restaurant, the CDA, CDA attacks, they in. come in, they, the one guy says, all clear for decontamination. And as they're running away, Mike says, Sully, that could not have gone any worse. And the way it was in the original was, it was like a mushroom big cloud fireball the of the restaurant being imploded, you know, which was hilarious. Like we showed it. Papers. And, oh, forever. Yeah. Yeah. and then yeah. it was the most unfunny anymore. thing. Right. Well, we ended up doing like a plasma kind from of effects yeah. in the background. Right? Yeah. But we got as far away from an explosion right. as possible right. because it was just so yeah. Yeah. not something anyone But even then, it was so uncertain. At the time, you're looking at it going, do we change it? Will this be funny again, ever? The thing that I remember most fondly about that time is that when the movie did finally come out, we had so many people come to us and say, thank you. Thank you for giving me something I could, we could go out and do as a family, you mm -hmm. know, because people had, you know, sheltered their kids from the news, and, and again, the mood was so dark in the world. And people weren't going people, out. People weren't people, going out, yeah. but they went out to see monsters yeah. in droves. We had so many people come to us who were so happy that we yeah. gave them an escape from yeah. everything that was going on. It was escapist, but it's also talking a lot about how to face fears, and I mm -hmm. think, especially with kids, you hear a lot that, that this is a way that, you know, Mike and Sully are a way that they learned how to not be afraid, you know, and especially at that time. Oh, he's a happy bird. 
And it definitely feels like a Pete Doctor film to me. I yes. mean, even you know, yeah. and I and you animated that last shot, yes. you know, of yeah. Sully's face, and I think that sums it up for me. Just how much heart that you put in this thing, and just how interesting this world was. Well, I always wanted to do a scene in the film. But you know the days are pretty packed, so it's hard to do, and, and that almost we were, didn't come to be. Either. Right, we were arguing about whether Sully should go in and we see Boo or not, mm -hmm. and then you had this idea that you ran with showing it at the preview uh, with an audience. It was just on boards, and I remember that being one of the points of contention that a lot of audience members. Well, those were the biggest notes. We want to go in. We want to go in end. with mm -hmm. Sully and see Boo because it was. They felt like it was a working. That relationship yeah. was really working. Yeah. And so some we people got a would lot take that note that. and say, "Well, then we should do it. We right. should go see Boo because lots of people want to see that." Yeah. And there was a but lot of discussion about it. But it, I just knew that no matter what we did, it would never be as good as what was in people's heads. And it, it was actually a fairly simple scene to do, which is which another reason why. I, the hardest. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it was just an emphasis on the acting, and I think the story did a lot of the work for you, you know? Yeah. That by the time that, that he opens the door and his face lights up, you're sort of primed for that, you know, that the story had worked to that point, and it sort of resolves in a satisfying way that hopefully allows the audience to kind of create what happened next. Mm -hmm. Kitty. That's why I like it. It's hope for the future of yeah. what's going to happen next. Yeah. yeah. I cry Resolution. every time. <laughs> I do. I cry every time. I, let's I try. See the... Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> when I see his art. I see. Uh, <laughs> the end. The end? Monsters Inc. The Monsters Inc. Yeah. The Monsters Inc. Let's do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey. hey. <laughs> 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 <laughs>